The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Sana. I am a new intern um, doing my internal medicine year before my radiology residency. And um, I will be co-hosting this webinar today about planning your M4 year and um, sort of some of the preparation that comes before that with electives and step two CK and a little bit of CS as well. And I would love to pass to my co-host and she can introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, my name's Jackie. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Massachusetts. I'll be applying, actually I just applied to internal medicine residency programs um, and I've been with MST for a little more than a year now. And I'm really excited to be co-hosting this with Sana. Awesome. So hopefully we'll have some good tips for you. Um, and just a little bit of details about what we're going to cover today. Um, so the first thing we're going to be talking about will be really elective tips. Um, so sort of talking about what you should be doing on your different electives that you go on throughout the year um, and what you should be using to prepare for them. Also talking about one of the things that's the hardest about third year is finding time to study, finding what resources to use to study, um, and we're going to be going over that as well. Um, another thing that we get a lot of questions about is timing, so when to take these exams, um, including step 2 C CK as well as CE for um, our COMLEX students, um, and then CS or PE for the COMLEX students again. And then we'll have a little bit of a Q&A at the end where we can talk about any questions that you guys have for us and any specific um, concerns that you have regarding your particular situations. And just some logistics about after the webinar. So we do have um, a survey that we really, really would appreciate if you could fill out. Um, we really take all of your feedback very seriously and we hope that all of the feedback you give us will be used towards making these webinars better in the future and finding out how we can best provide content that's useful to you and is an actual good use of your time. So let us know if there's anything in particular um, in the survey, we would love for you to fill that out. And the link will be in the chat below. And then of course, at the end, we'll have the Q&A, as I mentioned. We'll stick around about 30 minutes after we finish our content, and we'll pick all of the questions that we think are broadly applicable to everybody and sort of go from there. And as we sort of go through the webinar, when Jonky's talking, when I'm talking, we'll take turns sort of answering the questions in the chat. So feel free to throw them into them as we're talking if you think of something off the cuff. Um, this is what I just said. <laughs> so basically, if you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to just type it in. It'll come up and then we will answer them sort of as we go or towards the end um, based on what we have time for. And if you have more specific questions regarding your personal situation, then please feel free to ask for a, a personalized consultation and email us. Um, all of our contact info is readily available and we'll have it up at the end as well. All right. Okay. <laughs> we'll just dive right in um, into yeah. third year and what the goal of third year is. So ultimately, all the clerkships, the core clerkships that you go through during third year is to learn how to take care of patients and to learn as much content as possible from your patients. Um, so you will develop a great fund of knowledge and everything you learn during your third year will help you prepare for step two CK. Um, you'll also carry everything you learn into your fourth year, into your way rotations if you choose to do them, and ultimately into residency. So the goal is to have fun, to try to figure out what specialties you like, which ones you don't like, and to just narrow down on what you think you might want to do for the rest of your life or for the next few years. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, just try to have fun. Absolutely. And so there are a couple of ways that we think about um, what clerkships, um, how, how to divide the clerkships. So there are the foundational clerkships. Um, the big one that everyone thinks about is internal medicine. So these are really the bread and butter, the basics, what you really need to build on top of. And so there are some philosophies in terms of when you should do different clerkships and what you should be taking from them. Internal medicine is one of those that would really be very, very essential to take towards the beginning of your clerkships if possible to sort of lay the foundation for the rest of third year and lay the foundation for fourth year and residency beyond. The principles you learn here in terms of how to do a presentation, how to do a physical exam, how to think about a differential diagnosis 
are really, really crucial in terms of carrying forward and thinking about your future rotations. Standalone clerkships are a little bit more of the more specialized one. OBGYN is its own world. You will never think about labor and, labor and delivery except when you're on OBGYN. You will never think about sort of fetal heart, fetal heart monitoring until you're on OBGYN and you won't think about it afterwards. So really having these isolated um, different clerkships that have very discrete and different learning goals than the rest of your year. And so those are better in general to schedule towards the end of the year once you already have a framework of how to think about medicine. Um, and so really push those later, OBGYN, pediatrics, some of the surgical subspecialties as well. I think it's much easier to start broad, start thinking about everything, and then sort of pare down what you think is important as you go along. Because at the beginning, you just won't know what's important to know, what's important to really include in a presentation, what's important to include when you're doing a physical exam. And that's why starting with something like internal medicine, which covers absolutely everything, um, is really helpful. And so the big thing is that these standalone ones, because they're, they're a little bit later, it's easier to be good at them. And it's a lot harder to be really strong in OBGYN if you're doing it as your very first rotation. By, all, by no means is it not possible. You can absolutely be great. Um, but I think it's a little bit easier when you have that foundation. Um, and then one other thing that we like to mention, um, family medicine. So some schools have required family medicine clerkships, some do not. Um, at my school, Junkie and I went to med school together. At our medical school, we, um, we did have it as a required clerkship. And so the shelf is very, very difficult. And so it's very difficult and it's also very great in terms of practicing for step two CK. So that's another one, even though it is a little bit more foundational and that you cover everything, it's helpful to have closer to when you're studying for step two. Any other thoughts on that stuff, Junkie? Just to add to the family medicine, I think family medicine might pull a little bit from OB, a little bit from pediatrics, a little bit from, um, from internal medicine. So it has a little bit of everything, which is why the shelf is so challenging and why it is great prep for step two CK. But um, we'll get to this too, but regardless of the rotation, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't affect anything severely. So yeah, don't worry absolutely. as much about it. So on that note. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you don't get the ideal order that you want, that's totally fine. I would not stress about it because you can make the most of any rotation no matter where it is in your schedule. However, we do like to say that when you are thinking about the order you want to do your third year clerkships in, try to put the specialties you think you might want to do a little bit closer to the beginning and save the ones that you have probably ruled out for the end. So um, you can figure out if you actually like the things you were thinking initially. Um, it's Again, it's totally fine if at the end of your third year you love a rotation and decide to change your mind. I know that happened to Sana and it worked out for her. Um, so she's an example of it really doesn't matter what what order your rotations are in. Um, yeah. But l as we reiterated, if it's possible to do medicine at the beginning, it's a great foundation for, for the rest of the rotations. You learn great presentation skills. Um, you get a little bit of everything about how to take care of adults. Um, and so it is helpful when you move on to the rest of your rotations. Yeah, absolutely. So exactly what Jonky said. And the big thing really is don't worry, it will be fine no matter what, but to whatever degree you have some level of control, and I know it's probably not a lot, um, just you know, think about the fact that it'll be easier to set up a ways if you need to, it'll be easier, not impossible by any means, but it'll just make your life a little bit easier if you figure it out earlier. But if you don't, that's also fine. <laughs> Okay, so trying to maximize your study time during clerkships, which is one of the biggest stressors I think medical students have when they go into third year and their time is not their own. Um, so you will be going into wards from six to six, six to seven, and you'll be thinking, how do I incorporate any kind of studying when I come home? Um, so what we like to say is that um, you have to prioritize learning that will be active learning. So that includes cue banks, flashcards, not just reading and trying to absorb that way. And unlike step one, where we had one book that had all the information we needed, there's a lot of different resources for shelf exams and for CK. Um, and we will get to that a little bit later. So um, don't worry about that right now. But the main thing um, is that 
you will need to carve out time every night to do a little bit. It's not a good idea to save everything for the week before your shelf exam or even the few days before your shelf exam because that is when it gets extremely overwhelming. So if you car carve out an hour a night um, to do a little bit or even if you have downtime during your actual rotation, I think it will be really beneficial when you get to the exams. Um, and I actually downloaded the UWorld app on my phone um, and would, it was able to do a few questions during lunchtime or when my residents didn't really have anything for me to do. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about the specific resources, but um, it, it is gonna be difficult, but you just have to prioritize a little bit of time every day and set it aside. Yeah, I think really to echo this, I personally, and what I've talked to a lot of my students about is, it is such a shift in how you study from step one. And I think it's really, really challenging because most people have a four to six week dedicated study period for step one, where they're doing nothing but study. They're able to spend their entire day devoted. And if they get distracted for an hour, that's okay because they have the rest of the day um, when they're studying for step one. When you are studying for step two in your shelf exams, it's really difficult and particularly because you come home, you're exhausted. And then on top of that, you have to do another set of UWorld questions. Um, but really, I think the key is just keep going a little bit every day, exactly like Junkie said, and, uh, and uh, um, go from there. Go from there. So um, the clerkship specific resources and, and tips. And as we said, there's really no one resource that is considered the gold standard for step two CK or even for shelf exams. And it'll be a lot about figuring out how you learn best and adjusting your resources to your learning style. So we'll go clerkship by clerkship. So internal medicine, the main resources that we recommend are pocket medicine, which is a small book that you can actually fit in your white coat pocket and kind of boils everything down to a few paragraphs or a few lines and gives you the essentials that you would need to know for almost every differential diagnosis you could think of. And then step up to medicine is um, a much more detailed resource. It's a textbook. And I typically don't recommend my students read it cover to cover, but it's more of a resource that you go to if you need clarification for a certain topic. Absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise, if you try to read it cover to cover, you won't remember anything and um, it will just be very overwhelming. So the types of things to know for internal medicine are the bread and butter cases like Sana was talking about. So heart failure, pneumonia, renal failure. Um, things that you would see in a lot of the patients that come into the hospital. That's what you're going to see most of the time. Um, and you will shine if you know how to manage those few common diseases. Um, for emergency medicine, we recommend case files, which is a short book that presents you with patient cases, will give you questions, allow you to answer, and then kind of walk you through a history, a physical, and then coming up with a differential. Um, for emergency medicine, you have to know fluid management and resuscitation. Um, you might also be um, tasked with figuring out um, when to consult other services. So when do I want to consult surgery? When do I want to consult medicine? Um, and that's basically what um, we recommend for emergency medicine. Pediatrics, um, our resource that we recommend is Blueprints Pediatrics. It's another textbook. Um, and in, this is one of those specialized uh, rotations. So here you definitely need to know pediatric vital signs, the different ranges for heart rate because they differ from adult um, recommendations. And then also just knowing the pediatric vaccination schedule. If you are going on an outpatient pediatric rotation where you're spending time in the clinic, especially doing school physicals, yep. you will need to know the vaccination schedule. Um, for surgery, we recommend Pestana Surgery Notes. It's a very, very tiny textbook that you could probably read in a day, and it gives you all the basics of anything you would want to know about surgery. Um, and then something to practice on your own at home is to learn basic knot tying, and you can find these on YouTube. Um, just look for instrument ties or hand ties, and just know a few so that if someone asks you in the OR, oh, do you know how to suture, you can say, yeah, I like, know some of the basic knot tying. So that was a lot, and now we're moving on to <laughs> more of the subspecialties. So OB-GYN, as Hannah said, is gonna be difficult because this is a world of its own. Um, fetal heart rate tracings are gonna be huge, and they will tell you what is going on with the mother, what's going on with the baby, and a resource to use for that is um, Blueprints for OB-GYN. 
for psychiatry, first aid for the psych clerkship is, I would say, the gold standard for psych. Yeah. Yeah. I th it's the only book I use and it was more than enough to do well on the shelf exam. It has all the drugs, it has all the diseases. And if you know um, all the diagnostic criteria, you will do well on the shelf exam. And the drugs are huge for um, psychiatry. So just knowing the side effects and when you would wanna give it. So do you give it for a depressed patient? Do you give it for schizophrenia? That kind of thing. Um, and you'll be you'll be golden for the, for the shelf exam. Neurology, um, doesn't have any specific textbooks, but I think the biggest thing for neuro is to learn the neurophysical exam. You will most definitely be asked to do this on a patient from head to toe. Um, so you should definitely practice that before you start the neuro exam. And for all of these rotations, case files, um, blueprints, those are going to be good resources to use. So for neurology, even though we're not specifically recommending, we can say case files is probably good. Um, and then family medicine, the types of things to know for that are screening guidelines for common disorders. So when do you diagnose diabetes? When do you diagnose hypertension? And how do you treat those common things? So similar to internal medicine, focus on the bread and butter and you will be good because you will definitely see it more multiple times in a day. Yeah, absolutely. And one quick point of clarification, sorry, there was just a typo on the slide. It should be case files for emergency medicine, not case files. I am for that emergency medicine. So just to clarify that. Um, but unfortunately, there are, there are a lot of different resources and there are a lot of different ways to go about doing this. And I think another important thing that I would sort of put out there is these are our recommendations and these are sort of the things that have worked for most of our students. Having said that, every student is different. So if you're sitting down with Blueprints OB and you just cannot get through it because it is a very, very dense textbook and it is a lot of content, then switch it up, do something else because staring at a book that you're not reading is less useful than just doing some more questions somewhere else. So these are sort of our first line things that we would go to to begin with. Um, but again, of course, sort of figure out what works for you and um, see what other resources are out there too. And I think here I can add, talking to students who are older and who have done this um, is gonna be really helpful. So talk to people who just did the rotation before you and say, how did you study for the shelf exam? And absolutely. that would be probably better than anything else. Yes, absolutely. Um, so this is what I was talking about before about the UWorld app. Um, so I would say you can, UWorld will always tell you how many questions there are per specialty. And if your goal is to get through all of those questions by the time your shelf exam comes around, you can just divide by the number of days and say, I'm going to set aside time to do 20 questions per day on my medicine rotation. And you can download the app. You can do it in your free time. And residents will love that you are using your free time to study. Um, and a lot of times they might even join in um, and, and do it with you. I had that happen a few times. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Um, so the goal for you world or for the QBank um, should be to finish all the questions once during third year. Um, that will set you up for step two CK and um, it'll give you good practice before you get to the real thing. And Sana, do you have anything else to add about you world here? Yeah, I think the big thing is really to start you world like day one of third year. Um, I think a lot of people, because for step one studying, people buy it a little bit later in the process. Um, you know, second year, you get through most of second year, and then you take a month and you sort of buy it around then. I think it's really important to get your world right away and sort of ch chug along at it every single day throughout third year, as Junkie was saying, because this is a much more longitudinal one, um, this exam, because this is going to be A, useful for all your clerkships, and be useful for all of your step two CK studying. Um, so this is not just a CK resource anymore. This is not just an NVME resource. This is a resource for every clerkship throughout the year. So I think it's really important to get it right away. And the same rules apply. The same rules that I tell my students in regards to step one studying, you know, do it times, do it whatever, make sure you're doing all of those same things as you get closer to your test day. If you have some downtime during your medicine clerkship, then by all means, feel free to do some in tutor mode. Um, but the vast majority of the time, I would say you should be trying to do it timed, try to simulate the real thing. Don't click certain boxes, click them all. Um, and well, if you're on surgery, only click surgery, but you know, um, within reason, um, try to really 
do it as if you were doing the real exam because that will be what gives you the best results. And kind of speaking to how can you use these multiple choice questions to effectively study, um, we recommend flashcard apps. So that's Anki and Memorang. Um, and um, we can go to the next slide where we talk about um, that. So the way we recommend students to approach multiple choice questions is, you know, you're going to pick a question and UWorld is going to give you a really, really long explanation for it. Figure out what detail you were missing if you got the question wrong that caused you to get it wrong. Was there one tidbit in the pathophysiology that you didn't remember that caused you to pick an incorrect choice? And if that's the uh, case, then that should be the topic of your flashcard. And we think you should only do like one line or one fact per flashcard to make it easier for you to go through them um, quickly. Um, and the UWorld explanations can be very overwhelming and so you don't need to remember every detail that they write over there, but you should try to um, pick out the high yield facts and you'll you'll be able to tell which ones are high yield once you get through all the questions because the same topics will keep coming up over and over again. Um, so that will reinforce what they think is important for the shelf exam and for step two CK. And the whole benefit of these flashcard apps is it's something called spaced repetition. So you can um, decide if a card was easy for you, it, will, it won't show it to you for th two or three days. If it's really hard for you, it might show it to you again in 10 minutes. Um, and this has been a proven strategy for students to help um, remember facts, like discrete facts for these exams. Yep, because um, a, lot of, a lot of medicine is um, just memorizing discrete facts. And so of course there's a lot of conceptual thought processes and sort of like branches of differentials that you have to think about. And there are a lot of algorithms that you're gonna be learning third year, which is very different than the thought process that goes into second year in terms of, okay, stable, unstable, and then a different branch point. There are a lot of branching algorithms that you're gonna be getting used to learning, but there are also still a lot of facts, a lot of just straight up memorizing, what is the cutoff, what is the criteria, what is, what is the definition of this? Um, and so for specifically those, these, these resources are really, really useful. And we got a question that I think is relevant. It says, do you think it's possible to do well on shelves with just using UWorld and Anki to reinforce it? And I think that depends heavily on how you're using UWorld. If it, you're using it as a textbook and trying to take it as much out of it as you can, I think it's definitely possible to do well on the shelf exams. I personally didn't love to read the um, descriptions, so I um, supplemented it with a textbook. But um, it's honestly, you can do well just using UWorld and Anki. And I think it's a personal choice on whether or not you think you're getting all the information that way. Yeah, I would counter that a little bit, um, just in that I think it depends also on the clerkship. Um, so I think something like the pediatrics shelf, for example, I thought that one of the things, um, there was just a lot of emphasis in UWorld on a lot of the genetic diseases, a lot of the memorizing these specific genetic conditions. And I felt the actual exam was much more similar to just actual clinical pediatrics and a lot of the cases that we were doing more in clinic and some of the um, case files cases that I was looking at. And I also felt that was similar for OB. I felt that OB, I don't think it would have been sufficient to just use UWorld and the Anki based off of the UWorld, because I do think there was a lot of nitty gritty details that I wasn't getting from those resources that I did see in blueprints that I saw in other places. So I think, I think it depends on the clerkship personally. I think internal medicine, UWorld is more than enough. I think UWorld absolutely covers everything you need for internal medicine. I think um, even something like neurology, UWorld covers a great deal of what you need to know for neurology. Um, but pediatrics, OBGYN, maybe even some surgery, I think the surgery shelf is a lot more medicine. So I, th I think it just depends on the clerkship personally. But Okay, so another resource that um, Jonky alluded to, and um, I think I might have mentioned, is case files. So when we were talking about the standalone clerkships before, so these are the ones that are a little bit more specialized and not so foundational as the other ones. So something like pediatrics, something like OBGYN, something like neurology. These specialties, which have a lot more 
very highly um, specialized diagnoses that you may have never heard of when you were studying for step one and doing this general medicine, I think it's really, really useful to have these case file cases because they go through, they have like a brief snippet of what a typical presentation is. So they'll say 56 year old woman comes into the clinic with blah, 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 blah. And it'll have a really clear picture of a classic presentation. And then it'll go through, okay, what is the initial workup? What do you do first? What comes back? How do you think about this? And it's not just going to tell you what the diagnosis is. It really walks you through how you should be thinking about this case, how you should go through the diagnosis, how you should go through the workup. And then once you have a diagnosis, whatever you needed to do to get that diagnosis, then where you go for first line treatment, second line treatment, and sort of going forward. And then also what are the complications, what are the associated syndromes, all of that. And so I think these resources can be very useful in sort of separating those out, especially for the standalone topics that, like I mentioned before, such as OB pediatrics, don't necessarily have as great coverage in UWorld. There's certainly do the UWorld, by all means, you should absolutely do the UWorld, but those ones I think can benefit from some supplementation with something like case files. Any other thoughts about case files, John Keith? No, I, I completely agree. Like, for example, I did not use it on medicine because as you said, UWorld was more than sufficient for medicine, but yeah. it would be helpful for OB or PEDS or even neuro where some you might be missing a few diseases. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's a really good way to help your brain kind of adjust to thinking about how to get through these problems. Yes, yes. It's a, that that's, brings up a great point. It's just like the structure of third year is very different in that you're not just picking a diagnosis based on a presentation. You're saying, what is the first step I need to do to work this up? Because in step one questions, they're going to give you all of this content and you'll already have enough to make a diagnosis. That's not the point. They're trying to get you to think more about the basic science. Step two and all of third year is saying, okay, I have this presentation. What do I need to seal the deal? What do I need to really confirm that this is what's going on? And what is the most urgent thing I need to do for them? Do they need to get steroids right away? Do they need to get antibiotics right away? What's the first thing I should be doing for them in terms of treatment, which is what real medicine is about. So I think it's a very different way of thinking. And I think these can be helpful in sort of acclimating you to that thought process. And then some other important resources. Um, pretest is really great. I actually particularly love pretest and have really recommended it to my students for neurology, especially. Um, the pretest questions for neurology are excellent <laughs> and they really, really help for the show. Um, so the other ones are also really, really wonderful, but I think especially for neurology, it's really a very useful resource. Um, but in general, I think the case files is usually better, except in the case of neurology. I think the pretest is really pretty clutch. What do you I think? I <laughs> agree with you. So pretest, yeah. if, if you guys haven't heard about this before, it's just a book with 500 questions. It's very similar to like the way that you world is, except the questions are shorter. They're ten they tend to be a little easier and the explanations are a lot shorter. So you can get through 500 questions a lot faster than you will you world. That is not to say do not do you world, definitely do you world first and if you have extra time then decide to do pretest but I agree with Sana that it was amazing for neurology um, it covered all the diagnoses um, and then you can always use it um, on other clerkships if you find oh you ran out of questions and you still have four or five days before the exam um, you're it would definitely be helpful to go through it and just one caveat about pretest is um, they do sometimes have typos um, and it can cause a little bit of confusion. So just take it with a grain of salt and look it up if you're at all confused about one of their explanations. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I think it's a pretty great resource. Awesome. Okay, and so I know we've sort of been talking a little bit about step two CK sort of along with all of this stuff. Um, but really the biggest piece of advice that I have, and I think Junkie and I both did this, but really take step two as soon as you can, once you're done with third year. It's very, very easy to say, everyone takes it later. I don't need to take it till I'm done with applications. I can take it during interview season. I can take it like before I'm graduating at some point. And I would really urge you to do it early and just get it over with. 
um, get it over with from the perspective of mentally being done with it, but also the knowledge that you have at the end of third year will steadily decline until you become an intern. And so I think it's really, really important to just start it right away. And um, you'll have all of this fresh knowledge, especially if you've been doing it the whole third year. If you've been doing UWorld, if you've been staying on top of your case files, if you've been staying on top of your Anki, then you'll be in the best position possible to take it at the end of third year and just knock it out. Um, I think the only caveats that I've heard are from people who say, I really need to do three away rotations. So I don't have time to take a month to do it. Um, and I will say that I had friends who were applying into orthopedic surgery who did three away rotations and still took it right at the end of third year. So I, I think it can be done. Um, of course, you know, everyone's situation is different. So certainly speak to your advisors, speak to your, you know, professors and see if it's something that is real, realistically feasible schedule wise. But if it's at all possible, I think it that's the move because it'll just be so much easier in terms of A, having it fresh in your mind so you'll need less time to study, and then B, just a mental relief so that when you're done with applications in September of fourth year, you're done. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have anything hanging over your head. Now you just get to chill. Um, so I think that's really valuable. I also think um, for students who had did not do as well as they wanted on step one mm -hmm. and want to show residency programs that you think you can do better on these exams than you performed on step one, you can use step two CK to show that improvement. And yeah. most students will do better on step two CK than they did on step one. Um, yeah. And if you take it right at the end of third year, as Sana suggested, you're more likely to do well because you just took like seven shelf exams. <laughs> um, that all repeated the same information. Um, and so if you take it right after third year, you're likely to do better and show residency programs that you can improve on these standardized exams. Absolutely, yep, great point. So uh, one of the questions we get a lot is how much time do you need to study for step two CK? Um, there's that typical trope of, you know, two months for step one, two weeks for step two, and a number two pencil for step three. <laughs> not recommend that um, so we like to base it on how you were how you did on step one so if you did well on step one and you were happy with your score and you used four to six weeks of dedicated time to study for step one then yeah you might be okay with doing two weeks of dedicated step two ck prep but that's a dedicated so that's 10 to 12 hours a day every day until your exam however if you did not do as well on step one as you would have liked and you needed more than six weeks to prepare for the exam, then we would recommend budgeting four weeks for dedicated step two CK prep. And now we understand that not all students will have the opportunity to take off an entire month or two weeks to study for step two CK. And so what we recommend in that situation is try to schedule an easier rotation towards the end of your third year so that you can come home and study a few hours every night. Um, if you're not able to take two or three weeks off to just solely dedicate to studying. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other point of that that is just hanging over it is that if you needed more than six weeks to prepare for step one and you didn't do as well as you would like, I think we budget the full month A to sort of fit your schedule and fit sort of the best ways that you prepare if you need a little bit more time to prepare, but B, so that you have more time to do exactly as Junky said, do better. We want you to do better on this exam. We want you to show the residency programs that you have the potential for growth. Um, and so I think that that sort of serves two functions in taking that month, again, if possible. Um, and I think that another thing that I personally did, um, because I finished third year and then I did my medicine sub-I, and because I hadn't done medicine since October of my third year. And so I felt I had missed a lot of the foundational things and had forgotten some of it already. And so during that medicine sub I, I was studying every day, A, for step step uh, to CK, but also just refreshing that medicine foundation. So that is another one because a lot of, a lot of um, medical schools require you to do a medicine sub I at some point during your fourth year. So that might be a good time for you to do that if you feel like you've forgotten a lot of the content because Med internal medicine is what step two is all about. It is really just very foundationally internal medicine. Of course, there will be peds, of course, there will be OB, but proportionally speaking, 
it is vast majority internal medicine. So if you need to do a clerkship and if you feel like you might have forgotten a little bit of your internal medicine foundational stuff, that could be a good clerkship to be studying during for step two during. And um, what we like to recommend to any student is to always test where you're at before you take the real thing. So you have to have at least one NBME practice exam. Um, if you don't have time for anything else, at least schedule time for one, just to know if you're in your target range before you take the real exam. If you are aiming to beat your step one score, which most of us are, you should take all the NBME practice exams. They are really great resources. They just give you additional questions and additional practice. And really they help you with the timing of the test, which is also gonna be really big. Um, and one thing to mention here also that we didn't mention before is the NBME also releases practice tests for shelf exams. Um, and they release four per every clerkship. So if you feel like you want to know how you're doing, you can take one of those NBME shelf exams for I think about $20 um, and get an idea of, of um, what you're scoring. Yeah, I think that is really, really crucial. Um, we, at least at UMass, we, I did like all of them before every shelf exam, because I think that was really the best resource in terms of replicating what the exam would look like. Um, and you know, when you were studying for step one, you took NBME practice exams, the shelves are just like that, just shorter. Um, so really make sure that you practice on the actual software and the actual, um, from the same question writers that wrote the exam. So definitely do those. And if you're tempted to reschedule step two CK, I would think critically about why you wanna do it. Um, if you were exhausted after a rotation or you really did not get any time to study, then, then maybe it's a good idea. But other than that, I think the sooner you can take it after third year, if you've had a, a quality amount of time to study, then it's probably not good to keep postponing it because as Sana said, you will continue to lose information and you'll be surprised at how fast it goes away if you're not <laughs> doing it every day. Yes, definitely. I was very surprised at the beginning of intern year at how much I had lost. <laughs> um, another great question that we just got um, was, do we use practice shelf exams when studying for CK? Um, and that's a great question. I think in general, I was surprised at how detailed the step two CK was in comparison to the shelves. I thought, oh, it'll be like the OB shelf light and it won't be as much detailed OB, which was not the case. Um, they still had pretty significant details. Having said that, I don't know if you'll have the time is really the limiting factor. I think it makes more sense time-wise to stick with the UWorld, make sure you're doing all of the UWorld questions, go through the OB questions specifically and go through first aid for OB or the OB section of step two C, um, first aid and really make sure that you've refreshed your knowledge there. If you have time to go through the practice shelf exams, great by all means, but really I think it will be more useful to do the NBME practice CK exams and see how much OB is there and sort of apply that moving forward. Um, so I, if you have time, absolutely, I think it's useful because there is a fair amount of heavily detailed content on CK. Um, it's just a matter of time, in my opinion. Any thoughts, Jonky? Yeah, I agree with you. I was just gonna say, if you find that you're consistently weak in one subject, then maybe you can set aside time to um, do those practice shelf exams. Yeah. Um, but agree with Sana that you're most likely not going to have time if you're only setting aside a few weeks to study for CK. And generally, you'll probably have a bigger score increase if you can improve your internal medicine knowledge than if you can do any other field um, because it's more than half of the exam. Yep, absolutely. All right. And so the other question is about step two CS. Um, so step two CS um, is a question that a lot of people ask, how much time is required to study for it? And it really depends on each individual person. Um, so step two CS is a very, it's an OSCE based exam for those of you who don't know. So there are I think five sites in the country where you have to travel to and you take basically an OSCE where you go into a patient's room, you have standardized patients in the rooms and they give you a presentation of, oh, I've been having chest pain. And then you'll sort of talk to them, get their history, and then get a little bit more review of systems, relevant physical. And then you go outside and you say, okay, these are the things on my differential. These are the first couple of diagnostic things and the first couple 
management things that I would want to do for this patient. And so it's really, it's much less rigorous than step two CK. It's much more clinical medicine in terms of what you're seeing day to day on the clerkships. And so the differentials are pretty straightforward. So for chest pain, you know, you think about the classics like MI, PE, like any sort of musculoskeletal thing. And so those are things that you know just by being on clerkships for a year. So I would say really very minimal dedicated study time. Having said that, there it is true there, and I believe in the past it was something like 2% of people pay, failed this exam, and that number has gone up marginally, I think maybe from 2% to 3%, very marginal, but it is true that there has been an increase in the level of failing of step two CS. So I will say that this is not something to not take seriously. So I would still spend time to study for it. Um, but I certainly don't think you need two weeks to sit down and study just for step two CS. I would take maybe an afternoon a week to just go through cases, make sure you know the basic differential for any sort of chief, the big chief complaints. Um, but really not something you need to spend a ton of time going into hardcore diagnoses about. The other thing that I would mention about that is that it is very important to sort of review the format of the exam. So a lot of people walk into this blind. By, all, by no means do people sort of necessarily spend a lot of time going through this. And there are a lot of people who just walk into this exam. I do think just even the night before or the week before, go through the timing, how much time you're gonna have in the room, how much time you're gonna have to sort of foam in, foam, foam out, what layout to expect the questions to be in, what layout the actual computer setup is in, and just be aware of sort of how the logistics of the exam go because you don't wanna have to wait two or three stations to sort of get in the groove because that's half the exam. So you really wanna make sure that you get it, jump on it from the beginning. And the big resource for this is there is first aid for USMLE step two, and they have a couple of different types of cases. Um, but the big thing is this is presented to you as patient walks in with chest pain. What do you want to know? And so then they'll give you the relevant first details to sort of build a differential, the first things on their differential, the first diagnostic steps. So it has a lot of great initial chief complaints, and it's really all the classic stuff, chest pain, shortness of breath, headache sort of GI bleeds, very, very classic presentations that anyone who's gone through an internal medicine rotation should see. Anything to add on step two CS, Jonky? I think that's pretty much it. And um, one thing to mention is that you get 10 minutes to write a note, which is what Sana was saying about um, recording the history, what you found on the physical and your differential. There, You can go online and type in like USMLE step two CS. Yeah. Um, note or something and it'll pop up with the actual um, um, interface that they use yes. for the note for step 2 CS so if you want to practice um, and you can practice with a friend just have them pretend to be a patient give you a history and then just use 10 minutes to type up what you think is going on yep very very useful resource okay so switching gears a little bit so I know we covered a lot of stuff for third year and sort of planning and taking step two CKCS, all of that. Um, and then once you're starting to think about fourth year and electives, um, big things, most of the electives that you take for mo at most medical schools will happen during your fourth year. Um, some schools allow you to take a few electives during your third year, and certainly you should take advantage of those, but most of the time it will happen during fourth year. I will, what I will put a brief plug out for to everyone sort of who has any time during their third year is anything you think you might even have a hint of interest in, spend a week in it. Spend some time actually doing it and really devote yourself to it. A lot of times it's very tempting. You know, internal medicine, surgery, the core clerkships are really exhausting and you're working really hard. And it's very tempting to sort of do an easy elective and sort of not try to think about it. But this will really help to shape what you might spend the rest of your life doing. And there's really nothing more important than figuring out what your specialty is going to be. And so I think that this is a great opportunity to really explore. And again, I'm biased because I didn't have any, I didn't fall in love with any of my core specialties. And I had one week in radiology and fell in love with it. And that's what I'm going into now. So I really think it's important to explore anything you think you might be interested in just because 
it'll allow you the opportunity to see something else. And a lot of program directors on pretty much all of my interviews for sure, everybody asked me, how did you discover this field? And like, tell me about some of the fun things you did during medical school. Tell me about why you randomly decided to do an elective in this specialty. Tell me why I received this random thing on your transcript that's not a requirement. And so it's a big focal point of conversations and it's not really a great answer to say, oh, I just want to chill for a week. <laughs> so really try and put some thought into what you're going to do. I'm not saying you have to kill yourself and do an ICU week just to do an ICU week. But if you're interested in the ICU and you think that might be something you want to specialize in, then yeah, it might be a little bit of a harder week for you, but it's worth it to figure out if that's something you could spend the rest of your life doing. So I think it's really important to take advantage of these weeks and to sort of explore anything that you're maybe interested in, do it early, and that will make your life easier down the road. All right. And then a ways. Um, so away rotations, they're very variable based on the specialty you want to go into. So for a lot of specialties, internal medicine, for example, is sort of the classic one. It is absolutely not necessary to do in a way. And people say like, oh, but if I want to go to like the greatest program in the world, like, should I do in a way there? Like, no, you don't have to do in a way. I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. You do not have to do in a way. Um, however, if you want to go into dermatology, you really have to do in a way. Um, so derm, surgical subspecialties like ortho, urology, like ENT, um, emergency medicine, all of those you really unfortunately do have to do a ways and you have to do multiple ways. Emergency especially, I think they have a special type of letter called the SLOWS. I think it's like standardized letter of evaluation is what it stands for. And you have to get those letters in order to be able to apply into emergency medicine. And a ways are important for a number of reasons. A, to check out specific residency programs. So if you really want to go to one program in particular for any special reason, then it makes sense to do it away. Um, for myself, I really, really needed to be in Boston. So I did in a way in internal medicine in Boston because I was like, I need to show that I'm committed to this place. I have to be here for personal reasons. And so that's why I'm gonna do in a way here. There's really no other reason you need to do in a way there. Otherwise, another big reason you could do it is, as I mentioned, geographic region. Like I said, for me, it was one specific city, but a lot of people, the way I've heard it described is they do it to open up an area of the country. So if you do, if you are, if you've lived your whole life on the East Coast in Massachusetts, gone to medical school in this one place, and, but you're interested in going to programs in Texas or programs in California or programs in Ohio, it's really important to show those specialties that I'm willing to move because they care about that. They want to see, are they legitimately going to come to my program? Are they actually going to consider matching here? And are they going to rank us highly, to be perfectly blunt? And so by going to different areas, if you do in a way in California, that opens up the West Coast. It shows I'm willing to spend a month here. I'm willing to show you that I can come out here and really opening up the different areas um, to see that you can do that. And then also, as I mentioned, so for emergency, the letters of recommendation are really important. But again, like I said, if you have one particular program you really want to go to, then it's helpful to get a letter from them. People will carry more weight in letters from people that you, people that they know than people at your institution that they might not know. No matter how great the letter is, they will, there's a something extra if they know who it's coming from. Um, so I think that can be really valuable too. So again, generally, it very much depends on the specialty you're going into. Having said that, there are certain exceptions in that if you absolutely need to be in one place, then I don't think it hurts. Um, but it really, ways are very, very tricky because four weeks is not a lot of time to show like the extent of your knowledge and the extent of your capabilities. And certain people thrive in it and certain people don't. And sometimes you can serve to hurt yourself if you don't stand out. So just something to keep in mind. Jonky, what are your thoughts on away rotation? Yeah, I, so we'll talk about doing electives at home too and the advantages and disadvantages of that. But I agree with Sana, you have to know yourself. If a, 
rather than thinking about these competitive subspecialties, I'm talking in general about like internal medicine, pediatrics, psych, the ones that don't necessarily require them. Yeah. I think you have to know yourself before you decide to do an away rotation. If you are the type to kind of be a little more timid, take a week to warm up to your team, maybe it's not a great idea to do an away rotation because when you do four weeks at a different institution, you always have to be on, you have to hit the ground running and you have to keep in mind that their um, electronic medical record system may be different than the one at your own school and you'll be catching up to the other fourth year students who have already worked on that system. So yeah. you have to be pretty confident in your own abilities, be willing to be outgoing, introduce yourself to people and really just put yourself out there. Um, if you want to do an away rotation and be successful on an away rotation. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, not to say, again, not to say that you won't be a great doctor, even if you're timid, there is no reason that you should or shouldn't go to that program. It's just the nature of an away is it's hard to really show off in that setting. If you slight, if you take a little bit longer to warm up, that's really all we mean by that. And so this is sort of, other things that are important when considering away rotations. Um, so if you're going to a different part of the country, it's going to be expensive. You have to sublet somewhere for a month. You have to get your plane tickets out there. You have to find transportation out there. So expense is certainly a cost or, or expense is certainly a consideration. Another is schedule. Um, so all of the most I will say most institutions are on very similar schedules as far as the rotations go. They have the same four week blocks and they try to do that to make it standard so that people can do aways. However, not all of them. Um, so there are a number of institutions in the Northeast and also in the, on the West Coast that don't quite line up. So you might have to take two blocks off in order to fit one rotation in. Um, or take one block off in order to have an off schedule rotation. So you have to make sure that you'll still be able to get all of your credits to ensure that your graduation requirements are fine and that everything will work out from that perspective. Depending on the specialty and depending on the program that you're going to, doing an away does not guarantee an interview. Um, at some places it does. At some places, if you get an away, you get an interview. Um, but that is certainly not the case at all places. And so I think that it's really important to keep that in mind and say that you still have to do very well. You still have to, as Jockey said, always be on um, and really try to put your best, best, best foot forward, but not to, not to get complacent, I think is the best way to put it. So switching gears a little bit, we'll talk about doing electives at your home institution. Um, the counter argument is it's a very easy to schedule. You can drop them, add them kind of on whim if you want to. Like there's been electives that I've changed two weeks before I'm supposed to start. Um, you will also have a greater variety of what types of electives you want to do. So away rotations typically will have a few things that they offer to for um, other students to come and do, whereas your home institution will have multiple things within each subspecialty that you can likely um, test out if you want to. The other thing is that the grading system, you are already used to it, you know it, whereas when you go to an away institution, you are not necessarily sure what they're grading you on um, and how strict they are. And this is sort of what we talked about before as well, but if you're a little bit shy and you take a little bit of time to warm up to people, doing it at your home institution where you already know the system and you know the people is probably helpful. Um, I, and the other thing about staying at your home institution is most away rotations are typically heavily clinical. So you will be working with patients day in, day out. At your home institutions, you can do um, easier electives where you might get to try something in like public policy or um, do something that's not necessarily um, requiring direct patient contact. And if you're interested in things like that, um, that that's another advantage to doing a home elective. You can also schedule research time and things like that. Yeah, I think another great point that Jonky just makes there is that fourth year is one of the few, one of the last times that you'll have the opportunity to really explore anything you're interested in and have the time and the resources to do that. So if you're interested, as Jonky was saying, in public policy or if you're interested in doing global health, um, really having the chance to explore those interests during fourth year and having the chance to schedule that. Fourth year is also, it's a lot of, there is a lot of work that goes into the first half and 
preparing all of your things for residency, but the end of it and really exploring all of these other options is a great, great um, advantage to having the system the way it is, because I think that a lot of institutions really allow you to explore a lot, any interest that you may not have had time for, and you may in the future have less time for. Um, so really to you know, grow you as a person and not just have to focus on um, clinical care all the time is a really great, great option. Scheduling. Um, so as we mentioned, um, it really is important to plan ahead and it will save you a lot of struggle. So a lot of away rotations, VSAS is something that um, you will, if you are not already, become very well acquainted with if you're thinking about a ways, um, become familiar with. But VSAS is basically the online portal by which you can apply to away rotations. Um, you have to submit a personal statement. I believe some programs require you to submit um, a letter of recommendation. Sometimes you, or most of the time, you have to submit your transcripts as well, et cetera, pretty standard application process. Um, but I think it's really important to start thinking about this early. So I would say the December, January of your third year, start to make a list. Where do you wanna go? What might you wanna, what parts of the country might you wanna go to? And look into those programs requirements. Um, some of the most frustrating requirement things that were difficult were some schools required titers, some schools wanted like viral loads, like all of the different immunizations that you had to do. So just making a list, making your doctor's appointment so you're able to get those pieces of information ready um, and having a checklist of all the things that you need. That way, you know, all of these things are first come, first serve. So the day that the applications open, you should be submitting your application because they will start to offer you spots on a rolling basis. Um, so make sure that you, you know when you're able to apply and as soon as you're able to get everything in. Have it all prepped beforehand and then just get ready to get ready to put it in so that you can do well. And then it's also important to have an idea of if those special if the specialties and the rotations that you're applying to are competitive because if you want to do two aways in something that's very competitive, you might need to apply to six places in order to get those two aways. Um, so to have a good idea and to have backups um, and plan for how to best schedule your third, uh, your fourth year. The other thing I will say is in terms of canceling aways, sometimes that can be very challenging because you don't want to cut off, you know, relationships and close doors to you in interviewing prospects later. I think it's very important to certainly have backups, but don't over apply. Don't apply to 20 programs because you will, no matter what, best case scenario, have to turn 17 of them down. Um, and that is an awful position to put yourself in. So you can always apply later. It is rolling, yes, but you can apply later. You will certainly still get offers. Try and just be judicious and apply to places that you would really absolutely consider going to a waste to. Otherwise, don't waste your time, don't waste their time, and really be judicious in how you're applying. And then the only thing we do want to specify as different is that for international students, there may be A, different requirements in terms of what you need in order to be able to rotate at other institutions. A lot of international schools have special relationships with particular institutions. So it's there are a whole bunch of steps that you'll have to take in order to get around that and go to other institutions that are out of network. And unfortunately, there are a lot of additional charges. Um, so just to apply to rotations, sometimes to do rotations, they'll charge an additional fee to take international students. So it's something to be aware of. It is sometimes very cost prohibitive, um, so just do your research, see what institutions require it, um, and make sure you plan ahead of time. Again, I would say December, January is when I would start looking at this stuff um, and get an idea. Having said that, just backpedaling very slightly, if you don't know what you're going into in December, that is totally fine. I did not know in December what I would be going into, and you can apply later. And as I mentioned, you will still get all of the opportunities. Like I said, some places open in February, some don't open until April and May. So really, it's completely fine to take your time in doing this. But if you know early, then plan as soon as you're able to. If you don't, don't worry about it. First, figure out what you're doing, 
the rest of it will come when it comes. The most important thing is to figure out what field of medicine you enjoy and everything else will come and fall into place after. All right, so we gave you guys a lot of lot of information um, and it was a, a huge variety of things, but yeah. we'd just like to end by saying, you know, you've made it this far. Um, just keep in mind that you've accomplished a lot um, and it's, it's helpful to keep an open mind and stay optimistic as you continue in this process. Um, use your support systems, use your friends, your other students on the rotations. Um, they're your sounding board and um, they will help keep you sane throughout this process and just be confident. Um, you usually know more than you think you do, so trust your instincts. Um, and, and just try to have fun with this because you know you went into medicine because you loved it um, and try not to forget that as you go through third year, fourth year, and eventually um, to residency. Absolutely. I think really the big thing is you are on your way. <laughs> I know it's a long, long road, but exactly as Donkey said, really just keep having an open mind one day at a time. And then I always used to have, I think I had like a calendar on my list that I was like, okay, I'm going to work hard for five months. Then I'm going to chill for like 10 months. <laughs> and then I, it kept going down every day. And then it was, okay, then it was four months then it was three months then it was two. And it does get better and really just try and focus on what's immediately in front of you. And I know it's really easy to get overwhelmed, but really focus on what's immediately in front of you and the rest of it will sort of go from there. So we just wanted to end by telling you guys a little bit about um, who we are and what we do. So we sort of um, help students from the pre-medical days to all the way through residency. Um, we provide one-on-one -on -one tutors for shelf exams, step two CK, CS, CE and PE for the COMLEX students, and also provide consulting and um, mentoring for residency applications. Um, so if you wanted to work with us, you'd get a one-on-one -on -one tutor. We customize a study plan or study schedule for you. Um, and all of the tutoring sessions happen um, on video like this. So you can do it from the comfort of your own home. Um, and everything's customized to you. And something that's a little bit unique about our um, company is that we, in addition to the one-on-one -on -one tutor, you also get um, a someone from a student relations team who will help you with any concerns that you have. If you're stressing out, if you want to reschedule, if you need a care package, they're there for <laughs> you, and only you. So um, we like to emphasize that fact. Yeah. I think one other point I'll make is that what I really love about this company is that we have tutors from sort of all of the same places that we have students. Um, so we have a group of really, really diverse tutors. And even if I have not dealt with the specific struggles that you have dealt with, there's someone on our team that has. And so really we have people from all walks of medicine who are really, really knowledgeable and really brilliant and have overcome all of the challenges that face all of the different people um, in medicine. So I think it's really valuable that we have, we have someone who has dealt with what you have dealt with. And so I think that's really valuable sometimes just to know how, what people have gone through. And so now we would love to sort of open this up for our Q and A. Um, so anyone that has any questions, feel free to throw them in the questions box. We'll answer sort of as we go. And just additionally, before I jump into that, I just wanted to make you guys aware of our promo. If you mention this webinar and if you're interested in a tutoring session, if you need one, um, then please mention this and you'll get $100 off your trial session. But before that, let's just dive into some questions. So I have one there. Um, so if you're considering a bunch of different areas of the country, if you're considering three different states to live in, would it hurt to do rotations in all of those places or should you stick one and commit to it? Put what do you think, Jockey? What's your thoughts? I think it depends on where the states are. If they're clustered in a geographic area, as we were saying, like the Midwest or far west or the south, then it's probably fine to just do one away rotation in that area because, again, you're opening that area up and you're showing programs you're interested in living there. Um, however, if those three states are all over the country um, and you really want to go and stay in one of those three states, then it might be beneficial to try to do um, a few away rotations specifically in those locations. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that it, I completely understand the question in that I think it's I, a valid concern that programs might think, oh, well, he's open to a lot of different things. But I think 
programs also realize that this process, like nothing is guaranteed, right? Just because you do three aways in one state doesn't mean you're going to end up in that state. Um, so I think it's smart to really keep your options open and not to put all your eggs in one basket, right? I don't think it makes sense to do all of your ways in one state and commit to that one program because you just never know. You might end up interviewing there and say, oh, I actually don't like this that much. Um, so I think it makes sense to do them everywhere and sort of widen the net and sort of see what else is out there because programs will understand and they, I think it will open more doors for you down the road to do in a wider range of places if, if they are in fact in different areas of the country. All right, what else have we got here? Any other questions? Jackie, oh, here's, here's another one for you, ready? Would you recommend doing an away rotation for internal medicine if you have had academic issues in the past, such as failing, failing step one? So I think that depends more on how you did on your clinical rotations, if you've had any prior to applying for the away, which I'm assuming you have. So um, if you did well on your third year rotations, then I think it's perfectly fine to try to do an away rotation. However, if you also had difficulty doing well on your home rotations, then it might not be the best idea to um, do an away rotation because as we said, you really need to stand out. Um, you kind of need to like hit the ground running when you get to the um, place that you're trying to go to. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I completely agree. I think that failing step one is very different than what it means to do well as a, as a doctor, but also as a third year clerk and as an away rotator, I think it'll just depend a lot more on your personality. If you feel like you were a strong rotator in internal medicine, and if you feel like you have a good grasp of the knowledge, if you feel like you did well in your clerkship, and on top of all of that, you have the type of personality that would thrive in an away rotation environment, then I think it's totally appropriate to do an away rotation. I don't necessarily think you need to do one to overcome something like failing step one. Um, so I don't think that those things will cancel each other out necessarily. Like I think if you're worried that the step one score will hold you back um, and that doing it in a way might give you an extra push, I think that the best way to counter a bad step one score or a sort of less than ideal step one score would be a good step two score. I think that those things sort of contradict each other more strongly than a strong clinical performance. I think people will look at the step one score and say, oh, well, it was step one. Step two, I see they did a lot better. So I'm not as worried about this bad step one score versus clinical performance. I think people rate a little bit differently. So I think people see those things as disparate. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I also wanted to um, say something about step two CS. You know, if you felt that you were struggling on your OSCEs that your school gave you, or you had a few that you didn't do well on, that would be a sign that you do need to prepare more for step two CS than what we recommended. So our advice was generally for people who have done pretty well on OSCEs um, and are confident in their um, ability to talk to standardized patients. Um, if on the other hand, you struggled a little bit, um, then maybe ask your advisors or mentors to do some practice cases with you and give you some feedback on what you can improve on. And the, the reason I say that is because standardized patients are a lot different than the patients you will see in real life. And they have very specific criteria for grading you. So just because you did poorly on an OSCE or you're not confident in your ability to talk to standardized patients doesn't necessarily mean you're not great at talking to real patients. It yeah. just requires practice and requires you to think a little bit differently and sort of have like a mental checklist like, okay, I need to foam in. I need to ask these very specific questions about their chest pain. Right. Um, so just do a little more practice if you didn't do well on your OSCEs during third year. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really good advice. Um, okay. So if anyone else has any questions, feel free to throw them in. But I think the big thing, just giving sort of my parting words of advice, big thing for third year is really try to enjoy it as much as you can. Try to really figure out what parts of medicine you enjoy because they are so vastly different. Um, the things that draw people to the OR are very different than the things that draw people to internal medicine or what draws people to radiology. Um, so really to keep an open mind and really explore what you enjoy and really be reflective in that year and try and think back, what moments am I enjoying? What am I 
taking away from third year and then sort of carry that into fourth year. Explore the things that you think you might be interested in um, and sort of move forward. And then as far as the studying component goes, a little bit every day I think is really the key. Um, just stay consistent. It is a marathon, it is not a sprint. So really a little bit every day, be consistent, make sure you're chipping away at the UWorld questions, chipping away at the case files cases, and ask your peers around you what they've done. And that will be the best advice in terms of moving you forward and being successful. Yep. I just wanted to add to you're going to learn a lot from your patients just reading up on how to manage the specific things your patients came in with are going to show up on step two CK in your shelf exam. So don't worry if during the day you don't have time to study because honestly you are studying just by being in the hospital and interacting yep. with your residents and your attendings. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, on that note, we will wrap up for the day. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for those of you who sent in questions. If you have any additional questions, I'll just leave the slide up in case anyone wants to take a look at our contact information. Um, but please feel free to reach out to us if you have any additional questions, if you have any concerns about step one, step two, med school, anything in general, we are happy to, happy to help. Great. All right, thanks.